Hello, everyone, and um, a very warm welcome to the fourth lecture of the Inspiration uh, series organized by the Center for Research in Emerging Economies at Jindal Global Business School. Um, uh, this is the third installment of the Inspiration lecture series, and today we have a very prominent economist among us. Before we begin, here are some simple housekeeping rules for the attendees. Please uh, make sure that your mics are muted and your webcams are off at all times. If you have any question, please type your questions in the Q&A box and the professor will take the questions at the end of the lecture. So we have with us uh, Dr. Pascaline Dupa and she is one of the leading development economists in the world today and her research focuses on policies aimed at reducing global poverty. And she became uh, the new faculty director of the Stanford King Center on Global Development on September 1, 2020. Uh, Dr. Dupa is a professor in the De Department of Economics, and she's also a senior, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and at the Freeman Spogli Institute. She received a 2019 Guggenheim Fellowship, and she was named the best French economist in 2015 by Le Monde. She focuses her research on identifying scalable programs and policies to improve the well-being of low-income households in low-income countries. Among other things, <clears throat> she has conducted experiments throughout Africa to, to determine how best to price, target, and distribute essential health products, measuring the most effective ways to curb malaria, teenage pregnancy, and HIV infection. Dr. Dupa received her PhD in economics from the Paris School of Economics, and before joining Stanford, she has taught at Dartmouth and UCLA. Uh, she is also a fellow, fellow of the Econometric Society. She is an affiliate and board member of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, She's a fellow at the Bureau of Economic Research, Bureau of Research and Economic Analysis of Development. She is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She is a research affiliate at the Center for Economic Policy Research and an affiliate of the Center for Effective Global Action. She is a past editor of the Journal of Development Economics, and she currently sits on the editorial boards of several leading academic journals, including the Quarterly Journal of Economics and American Economic Review Insights. With this, I now hand over the mic to Dr. Dupa. Dr. Dupa, the stage is all yours. All right, thank you so much for this very generous introduction. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you some of the work that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Radhika Jain, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University. Uh, we've been working uh, together with the government of Rajasthan on their uh, health insurance scheme for the past four or five years now. And I'm um, looking forward to getting your questions and comments about, about this work. Um, this work is, is focused on um, gender disparities in access to healthcare. Um, and the, the starting point is that, uh, you know, there are huge gender disparities in, you know, many outcomes um, in, in India. And sorry, I'm having trouble moving my slides. Um, India is among the bottom five countries for female health and survival uh, in the world. Um, and there has been some evidence uh, already from a number of studies that there is a bias in how health inputs are allocated between uh, males and females in the country. Um, there are fewer health, uh, health inputs um, provided for females that leads to worse female health outcomes. And the welfare impacts of that are quite substantial uh, because there is this phenomenon known as uh, missing women. So the you know, latest estimates are that there are 63 million missing women, which are women who would uh, be alive if they had received uh, you know, the same uh, in inputs as, as, as men. Um, so one you know, flagship um, intervention that has been uh, put forward to try to reduce uh, gender inequalities in health, but also in other domain, education uh, in particular, um, is to try to reduce costs, make it as you know, cheap as possible, as easy to access as possible to try to make sure that even in households uh, that have uh, very little means, the, the women can also get uh, this care. And so you can think of the number of government health insurance programs put uh, in place by various uh, state governments in India over the past two decades, and most recently, the PMJ program uh, started by the center, as falling into that category of, of uh, health of, of programs that are you know, aiming to provide free uh, care for poor households um, with the idea that it's going to help reduce um, inequities in access and, and gender is one of the uh, targeted uh, dimensions of heterogeneity. 
So this government health insurance program uh, uh, giving uh, free care for poor households at both public and private hospitals. Um, and these are really quite large. And the, you know, the, the current uh, national program covers you know, the poorest 40% of the population in India. It was a huge budget. So the question we are asking in this study is whether subsidizing hospital care this way does actually help reduce gender inequalities in healthcare utilization. And so we are going to be looking at that in the context of a program in Rajasthan called BSBY, which was uh, in place from 2015 to 2019. And since then it's been renamed, but our data and, and analysis is going to be focused on the 2015 to 2019 period. Uh, that's BSBY is a public health insurance scheme that covers 46 million poor individuals in Rajasthan. And we're going to be able to do quite some uh, interesting analysis of it because we have uh, very detailed data on you know, over 3 million hospital visits. Um, under the scheme. And what we're going to find are very large disparities in utilization. And we show you that, for example, among children, females account for only 33% of hospital visits, so a third of the visits. Um, and I'm going to show you that it's not because there are less, um, that there are fewer illnesses among girls. Uh, it seems to be much more about households' willingness to pay being lower for female health than it is for male health. And as soon as you have, you know, even a small cost, that's gonna exacerbate inequality. Um, and the program failed at, you know, reducing the costs all the way to zero uh, because there are still some, uh, you know, travel costs, transport costs, um, and some, uh, you know, out of pocket charges that remain being charged, okay. So it's, um, it's very striking. We find that you, know, you reduce the cost of care seeking by providing this, this free care at um, hospitals. It does increase female utilization, but it does not reduce disparities, okay? Um, because it also increases utilization among men. Um, and so the, the gender gap doesn't actually get closed uh, at all. And so then we say, well, if, if, if reducing costs is not sufficient to uh, reduce gender disparities, then what can you do? It would be the case that, um, you know, changing um, attitudes towards uh, women in the society can make a difference. And one way through which um, uh, India has tried to improve the status of women in society has been through mandating um, female political leadership uh, on a regular basis. So through this uh, reservation system um, at various levels, but we're able to exploit the uh, randomized reservations for women uh, at the panchayat level. And we find that long-term exposure to local female leaders through this panchayat system does help reduce the gender gap a little bit in utilization of the BSBY care, but, but only modestly and not evenly. Okay, so it's not, it's not a panacea. It doesn't make a huge dent to uh, the inequity that we see. So our conclusions, uh, you know, I, I, in some sense are not, you know, um, particularly uh, uplifting. So I apologize, I know it's, a, it's an inspiration uh, lecture series, but you know, the, 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 I'm hoping that this will inspire you to want to work in this uh, where there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of issues to, to, to be sorted out. Our conclusion is that in presence of, of bias, um, gender neutral policies that are policies that just lower the, care, the, the, the cost of care for everyone, um, they, they may well increase female utilization, but they are not going to reduce disparities. And so to really um, make uh, a dent in gender disparities and move the needle on that, you need to target female cost of barriers uh, more specifically um, and you know, most likely uh, try to change their, their position in society, which obviously is easier said uh, than done. So that's, that's what the paper is about, just to give you an overview. So um, the context and the data, um, you know, this is, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, BSBY program uh, launched in Rajasthan in 2015, very late in 2015, December 2015. As you know, Rajasthan is a big state with 70, about 70 million people. And uh, one key feature of this program, which is very important to have in mind, is that uh, enrollment is automatic if you have um, a Bamasha card, which is a card um, that says that you know you 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 you've been um, uh, you're eligible for you know the program targeted at the poor. So it's about 46 million individuals who have a who, who are in the in the Bamasha system, um, and so you're automatically enrolled if you have a Bamasha card already. You don't have to pay a premium. 
uh, you don't have to sign up for anything. Okay, so that already removes a big barrier that people have seen in other contexts where even getting households to go and sign up uh, for a free program can be a huge uh, problem. If you, know, you have to go somewhere far, <clears throat> you have to be aware, um, all that can be barriers to enrollment. Here, you know, this problem is taken care of. There's no, no enrollment, it's automatic, okay? Um, and uh, households are not supposed to, to pay anything. So they're supposed to be able to get access to uh, over a hundred and, uh, sorry, 1400 secondary or tertiary services um, at, uh, at hospitals. Um, and they can use up to uh, about $5,000 uh, annually um, for, per, per household. Um, it turns out that this is not quite binding. We, we see most households don't use up all of the, you know, um, all of the amount that they are uh, entitled to, 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 to use uh, per year. And this free care for this uh, secondary and tertiary types of procedures um, is at all, you know, public hospitals, there are about 500 of them. Um, and, uh, you know, 1,200 uh, private hospitals are there about and paneled into the scheme. So from the hospital's point of view, it's voluntary to empanel. Um, and, you know, there was a ramp up over time of how many private hospitals were empaneled. And um, at the end of our study period, 2019, it's uh, 1,200 uh, private hospitals empaneled. And most of these hospitals are, you know, relatively small, located in, in towns and, and, um, and cities. Um, those in the bigger cities provide uh, more specialized services. Um, and as you know, many of you uh, already know, the quality in the private hospital is typically higher than in public hospitals. And that's also what people um, think when we ask them um, their beliefs. And you know, for uh, those of you who have been following uh, Radastan's um, policy, uh, just you know, the, the scheme has been renamed. Um, as of September 2019. Okay, so now it's not BSBY, it's ABMGRSBY. Um, and the key feature is how hospitals are reimbursed. So hospitals are reimbursed directly at a pre-specified rate per service. Uh, and that's supposed to cover all costs. So what does it mean? It means that if, uh, let's say, you're a woman and you come and um, you give birth, uh, in the hospital, um, you know, delivery is, is, is covered by the scheme as a you know, secondary uh, type of care. You come and you give birth and it's a vaginal delivery and there is no complication whatsoever. It's gonna be called the basic vaginal delivery and that's gonna have a reimbursement rate, okay? And in uh, the beginning of the period, it was 3,500 rupees, okay? So the hospital gets 3,500 rupees um, for each basic vaginal delivery that they do. Um, and it's not the patient filling any form, it's the hospital at the time they take the patient in, um, they register the patient in the system, it's a, you know, a very uh, advanced IT system, uh, they immediately put in the um, patient's information, and then at the time the patient is discharged, they mention which package uh, was provided, so if it's a basic version of delivery, it's going to be 3,500 rupees, and then the hospital is going to get reimbursed by the scheme, by the insurer, you know, within typically um, a couple of weeks, okay? So that's a very efficient um, electronic portal uh, through which everything is happening. Now, if the, the delivery is not a basic vaginal delivery, if it's a vaginal delivery, but, uh, you know, there was a tear and you need a repair, then it's a vaginal delivery with tear repair, and that's um, reimbursed at a, a slightly higher rate. So it's 4,000 rupees. Um, if it's a C-section, uh, it's yet another rate, it's gonna be 6,000 rupees. If it's a C-section with preeclampsia, it's another service, it's another rate, okay? So that's that's how the, the, the rates are pre-specified. So it's it's um, not adjusted for, you know, uh, the actual, for, for risk or for the actual cost. So it could be that some, some C-sections cost more than some others uh, to the hospital. Uh, even conditional on there being preeclampsia, it could be that sometimes it's more expensive than in some other cases that's not taken into account, the hospital get a fixed rate for a given um, a detailed service, okay? Um, so that's, that design is actually very similar uh, to the current uh, PMJ design. So we have access to uh, the claims data. So every hospital visit between December 2015, which was the inception of the program and October 2019, uh, which is when we stopped having uh, access to the data, we have um, all of the claims filed by hospitals, okay? And that's about 6 million claims. And that includes the name of the patient, their age, their gender, 
uh, phone address, the name of the hospital that filed the claim, uh, the, the, the hospital is, is um, private or public, um, the date of the, the date uh, of the care, and then the more, very importantly, the service rendered or the package uh, rendered, okay, with a code. Um, and because we're going to be looking at, um, at the gender composition of the patients, this information about you know the, the sex of the patient is going to be very important for us. And so the first thing you may wonder about is the extent to which this information is, is accurate. Is it reliable? Can we trust that hospitals accurately reported the gender of the patient? And the answer is yes. Um, here I'm showing you um, uh, data that we um, collaborated between the claims data and surveys. Um, so we've, we've, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a minute, but we were able to uh, make quite a number of um, audit surveys by phone um, with, you know, close to 10,000 patients. And we can, um, and so we can check whether the gender of the patient as reported in the survey matches what we see in the claim. And on average, the match rate is very high at like 98%. Um, and it's it's higher uh, if the if the claim is for a male patient, we can confirm in almost ninety percent ninety eight percent of the cases that indeed uh, the patient is male. If the claim is for a female patient, it's slightly less. So that means that some of the female patients are actually male patients. Okay, but on, overall is very rare. It's for you know the younger for kids that it's this more common and there's a mistake. Um, are for the very um, elderly. Okay, where things are less uh, precise, um, and so, but but never even in those cases, it's still very very high accuracy, and so we can um, you know rule out that any gaps we see in the composition of patients in the data comes from misreporting of, of gender. Okay, so you can take this the, the data that I'm going to show you as being very reliable. Um, we are going to be excluding. Uh, Data from 2016 because that's when the information, this information was was um, not as uh, well um, uh, recorded uh, on average, and so so we exclude 2016, the first year of the program. We exclude any visit treated to childbirth because that's obviously very specific uh, to women. There is no counterpart for men, and for infant claims, that's where we actually do not have um, the, the 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 gender of the child. Um, we have only the gender of the of the mother, which is, you know, make it equally uh, female. So we don't know the gender of infants, which is really um, unfortunate. It would be very interesting to be able to look at gender disparities among infants, but we don't have that. So ultimately, we're going to be using 3.3 million visits uh, after we've excluded those those um, those visits. And we uh, augment this data set of claims by geocoding um, all the location of all the hospitals, but also the patient residents. So um, with this address that we have, uh, the patient address in the claims data, we're able to, you know, um, find a geocode for the, you know, the, 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 the village and of the location of the patient. Uh, and then that allows us to, kind of, on the one hand, um, link that to, you know, um, census data and information at the village level from the census data. It also allows us to calculate the travel distance for every hospital visit. Um, and so we, we, we are not able to geocode every single visit. Sometimes the address information that we have is, is not clear enough. Um, but whenever we are able to match it, we have a very high uh, confirmation rate in the survey. So, uh, you know, um, people uh, that we surveyed, if we check whether the, um, the, the geocode that we assign them based on their address in the claims that are match what they tell us where they come from in terms of the name of the village, um, 99% uh, confirmed, so it's very high accuracy. Um, and finally, we link all of this to data on reservations. Uh, we were able to get uh, access to information about which um, panchayats uh, were reserved for female uh, sap punches uh, in uh, 2005, 2010, and 2015 for Rajasthan, and so we're able to link uh, to link that. Okay, um, so. This is this is the data we have now. Um, we only have we have that on claims. Okay, we know what happens when people come to a hospital under the scheme. Okay, we don't have a representative, you know, household survey um, that tells us what happens when someone is sick in the household. We only see 
people who come for care under the scheme. Okay, so that's going to constrain a little bit what, what we can uh, do. I just want you to have that in mind. And then as we go through the results, we can discuss uh, what pieces are missing and would be helpful uh, to know more about from uh, other data sources possibly. So the first uh, main result is just purely descriptively, we see a massive gender gap. Um, so what you see here, the blue bars show the share of all the hospital visits in the scheme. So under the, you know, in the BSBY claims data that are for female patients by age group. So this is zero to nine, 10 to 19, 20 to 29. And so you see here that the 33 percent I mentioned in the introduction, only a third of all patients below the age of 10 are female. For those 10 to 19, it goes up to you know, 38%. Right? Uh, for women of childbearing age, that's where it gets close to 50%. And then it starts going down again for older age groups. And for women uh, 60 uh, to 80, it's right around 40%. Okay. Now, these gaps are much greater than the gap you see uh, in, the, in, the, in the population as a whole. So here in the, the diamonds, um, the red diamonds, I'm showing the share of women in the population as per the population census of 2011, uh, the latest uh, you know, census for which the data is available. And as you can see, the share of women is much greater. There is definitely a, you know, a, a, an imbalance in the sex ratio. Okay, that's you know, a, a well-known uh, problem. But beyond that, there's this huge gap in access to care. Okay, and you may say, well, the 2011 population census is for the whole population. We don't have a breakdown by poverty status. BSBY is only for the poor. So maybe the sex ratio is more skewed among the poor. That doesn't seem to be the case if we use the national sample survey and putting the 2014 and 2018 surveys so that we have more sample size and we look at the sex composition among the poorest half in those surveys. Uh, we, we also find you know gender um, a sex ratio that are very similar to the census is a bit more noisy. Uh, and again, it cannot explain these huge gaps that we see in the data. Okay, so there's just there seem to be missing female patients um, in the in, in the data. And then you may say, well, maybe this is good news. Maybe this means that women are not sick, women are very healthy, they're getting a lot of health inputs at home, and so they don't need to go to the hospital. Maybe that's great. Um, well, we can rule that out because we can use um the global bur burden of disease uh, data set for India. This is a data set that uh, estimates the prevalence uh, of various diseases by gender and age group. Okay, so in the claims data, we have you know we can look at big categories of care. We can look at you know, chronic kidney disease care, cardiovascular disease care, um, cancer or neoplasm care. Um, we have others like um, things related to blindness neurological disorder, mental disorder, digestive diseases. So for all these categories, we can match them to the global uh, burden of disease. And in the global burden of disease data, we know, okay, among, let's say, you know, men of the group uh, 15 to 49, the prevalence uh, of um, uh, chronic kidney disease uh, condition is, um, you know, X. And then for women on that same age group, it's Y. <laughs> so from that information in the global burden of disease, we can compute what is the expected share of patients that should be female given this prevalence is by, by these two, you know, for these two categories. And that's what we plot here. This is the, the female share of patients, you know, based on this like estimated prevalence levels by gender and age group. And so you see a huge gap here. So the predicted uh, share of female is much higher given what we know of the prevalence of the disease by gender uh, than what we see, okay? That's across all uh, age groups, okay? Um, so this, we can do that for, you know, um, all of these uh, categories of diseases that we were able to match between the BSBY claims data and the GBD data, and you see these huge gaps there, okay? So we can rule out that this, you know, uh, relative low share of women among hospital visits are due to women being healthier. That doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that they are, you know, we know that they are as likely to have these conditions, but they are just less likely uh, to be getting the care, okay? Um, so the, from that, we can compute the number of missing female visits 
if you will, is like taking these gaps here and then multiplying them by, uh, you know, the number of male visits we see. And then we can estimate that for nephrology, which is called in kidney care, we have about 150,000 missing female visits over that period, January 2017 to October 2019. Okay, go, uh, for cancer care, oncology, it's 43,000. These are types of care for which we need to do repeat visits. So these are not 147,000 unique women, because when you have a kidney, chronic, a kidney, chronic kidney condition, you're supposed to go to the hospital two, three times a week, okay? But this is just to say that missing visits uh, by female, and it adds up quite a bit. The only uh, category here where we see um, that women are relatively more likely to go than men is for ophthalmology, okay? Um, but for most of these things, we see, you know, a, a gap in the female share that's above 10 percentage points compared to what we would predict, okay? So pretty big, uh, pretty big gap. All right. So now, you know, there's also even condition on getting care, women get a different type of care. So we find that the female share of um, hospital visits and ABSBY is um, lower in private hospitals than in public hospitals, okay? So not only they are less likely to get care, but condition on getting care, women are more likely to be taken to the public facility rather than the private facility. And we know from household surveys that uh, households think that public is a lower quality uh, than private. We also find that women are much less likely to get tertiary care relatively compared to secondary care. Um, so again, when women are brought to the hospital is for less, um, you know, less uh, advanced, uh, less uh, like, you know, cheaper on average care um, at uh, public facilities. Okay, and so if we put all of this together and we look uh, at, um, you know, the uh, evolution over time uh, and, and how much we spend, you know, how much of the total BBY envelope spent by the government to subsidize this care accrues to male for this female, we find that the, the, the spending is definitely uh, skewed uh, towards men. So what this shows you here um, is the female share of visits. Uh, and here, this is the female share of spending, okay? And as you see, as the program expands and there are more and more hospital visits in the scheme, more and more hospitals get empaneled. If anything, the female share goes down. So that's very striking. And the program becomes bigger, the female share actually goes down, okay? Um, and the female share of spending, goes down. And so at the beginning, it's about 40% of the spending that accrues to women. And um, sorry, this is here, this is on that scale, 42% accrues to women and throughout the end, it's, it's less than 40%. Okay, so to put this in perspective, in uh, in the US, for example, the uh, public spending um, is actually female biased. In the US, uh, Medicaid, um, it's about, uh, you know, 56% of the spending accrues to women patient. Um, versus here where it's, uh, it's less than 40%, okay? So it, it's really, really uh, striking, uh, striking gaps, okay? Um, oops. So one other thing that we can do, um, and you know, already from this, uh, we see as the, the scheme expands, we don't see the female share uh, go up, if anything, it goes down, which is kind of surprising. So the key question is whether, well, maybe it's still better than before because you still have more and more visits. You still have, you know, more and more women coming. Um, so it is the case that the scheme increased access to care for women. I'm not saying it does not, okay? It does increase access to care for women, but not relatively more than for men. So they were starting from a lower base um, and they increased, you know, uh, proportionally. And so the, the, the gender gap doesn't go down. But to really tell you that the gender gap doesn't go down, ideally I would have data in the pre-period, which you know I only have that on as a scheme. So instead, what we can do, we can use the national sample survey. It turns out that round 71 and round 75 of the NSS, so that's 2014 uh, and 2018, uh, do have detailed models, mo modules on health and do ask about hospitalization. So from this, we can back out the female share among hospitalized patients. Um, in both 2014 and 2018, and we can do it by age group. And if anything, if we just compare this bar and this bar, it would seem that, you know, the uh, share female among hospitalized patients has gone down for um, children um, under 15 um, between the period before the scheme was introduced and the period after. So that's really surprising. Now it's, NSS is, is you know, is representative at the state level. They only have, you know, um, about 3,000 observations per, per round per, per, 
uh, for the state. So it's not it's not it's not super precise, but um, but we do we do um, we do not see for sure an increase in the female share for the uh, other age groups. Here it's again a decrease, and here it's a slight increase. So on the whole, we don't see this you know massive change in the gender gap uh, before and after. Um, that you know we, you would expect if the scheme had uh, you know succeeded in, in in reducing inequalities. Okay, so what are the barriers? Like what what you know that this is all like very gloomy. What can we do about that? Uh, uh, you know, understanding the barriers is really super important. So you can think of uh, barriers on the demand side and barriers on the supply side. So on the demand side, would be that households are willing to pay less for women's health than for men's health. Okay. And this is going to matter because care is never fully free. You always have to take the time to take a patient. Uh, um, or the patient is take the time to be in the hospital. You have to transport them. Um, so it, you know, as long as there is a preference to, um, so as long as there's a cost to to care. If I, you know, value the care for women less than for men, uh, then I'm going to be willing to pay those those costs less for women. So where could this come from? This, you know, lower willingness to pay for women's health. Uh, one could be test-based discrimination. So I just I just don't like women as much as I like men. Um, and another one would be well, no, actually within the household I like my uh, girls as as much as I like my boys. Uh, but the value of women's health in society is actually lower because there is societal level discrimination. So I personally do not discriminate. Um, you know, bad society discriminates, and so there's low female labor force participation because it's very you know, tricky for women to work, uh, you know, outside of the home or travel to go uh, work outside the home. Or I get all age support from my sons only, so I have more incentives to invest in their house. So all of this, you know, uh, norms, if you will, could make it that the value of investing in house for girls is lower. Okay. Alternatively, it could be you no. Know, it's not that I value the health of women less, but it's just the costs are higher actually for women because let's say women cannot travel alone. Again, due to societal level discrimination, it's not safe for women to be alone in a bus, or they have to do all sorts of stuff at home. I, I don't want them to take the time to go to the hospital because there's all sorts of things that needs to be done uh, at home that they are responsible for. Um, or it could be that women have completely internalized um, the discrimination, so they don't even complain when they are sick. So they, you know, have a terrible stomach ache, but they don't say anything. So now it's appendicitis. You know, they don't, and they end up not getting the care and, and dying from appendicitis just because they didn't expect anybody would actually take them for care. So this would be on the demand side. On the supply side, you may say, well, what happens is that hospitals charge, you know, out-of-pocket payments. Uh, still, um, so it's not free, um, and so that's in that case, I would like exacerbate this. Okay, so if you do have some bias within the household and the costs are not uh, are still high, then that would you know really keep the inequities um, looming large. Or it could be that hospitals turn away female patients more often. Um, you know, we don't we can't quite test that clearly, but uh, we don't think it's the case. There doesn't seem to be an incentive for hospitals to do that. But it could be fewer referrals. It could be that that uh, you know the primary healthcare uh, unit um, they are less likely to refer patients for secondary or tertiary care at hospitals. If these patients are female, and you come with a stomachache. If you're a woman, you're told, oh, you just have your pills, just go home and rest. If you're a man, you're told, yeah, you should go get checked um, and get some you know test at the hospital. So that could be one explanation. Um, or it could be that there are very few female doctors. That creates a mismatch. Women uh, would rather be seen by a male, um, a female doctor than a male doctor. And so then knowing that if they go to the hospital, they're going to be taken care of by male doctors may discourage them from going. So we think that some of this explanation uh, can actually be, be, you know, removed based on what we see. So the explanation that are about um, the cost of care seeking being higher for women, women not uh, complaining when they are sick, or you know, there being a mismatch in the supply side, the, you know, the, those are unlikely to explain the discrepancies we see for, for young children. Because as a young child, you need to be escorted no matter what, whether you're a boy or a girl, there's gonna be you know, a cost of taking that child to the hospital, it's the same. Um, and there's you know, a very little uh, cost, uh, opportunity cost in terms of chores because a child under the age of 10 is not really doing much at home anyway. And so the fact that we see big gaps by gender among children rules out 
this explanation. Also, uh, you know, there's no reason why a two-year-old baby who's a girl would cry less than a two-year-old baby uh, boy if they're in pain, okay? Um, so that explanation of not, you know, asking for help as much also um, doesn't seem to ring true. And then the mismatch explanation also is much less likely to be relevant because for a child, um, there's much less of a concern of the gender of the, of the doctor. Um, so instead, we're going to uh, document that, you know, there is, um, uh, you know, essentially, it, it, we think the main explanation is really households being willing to pay less for women's health as for men's health. And to show you that, I'm going to show you very quickly that first, costs remain high. So from the audit surveys we did, where we, we called about 20,000 patients um, because we had their phone numbers. So we know they had gotten to the hospital in a few weeks prior based on the claims data. We called them up and asked them about their visit and ask them whether they had to pay anything. And we found that 29% of patients reported, reported having to pay out of pocket and the average was about 1,200 rupees. So these are still significant out of pocket charges. There's a whole other uh, you know, uh, question as to why hospitals do that. And Radhika Jane, my co-author studies that in a, in a paper of hers um, that um, is a job market paper. She's uh, looking for a position at the, uh, this year. Um, so she studies that in a separate work, fascinating work. You should absolutely um, invite her to talk about it. Um, but we find that, you know, th th there is quite a large um, out-of-pocket charges being charged by the hospital uh, for many, um, you know, many procedures. We, we surveyed uh, mostly um, private hospital patients, but for the few public hospital patients where we are rated for delivery and, and hemodialysis, we also see out-of-pocket charges, okay? So the costs are still there, okay? Uh, and we find that the higher the cost, the lower the female share. So we can compute the average out-of-pocket charges that hospitals charge for male patients for a given service. And then we can regress you know, the female share getting that service on that cost. And we find um, a very sig uh, significant uh, negative relationship. So the higher the out-of-pocket charges, the lower the female share, okay? So that suggests that um, essentially, the households are deterred by, by high costs. And then we, another form of cost is transportation um, or distance cost. And again, here we find that the female share of visits um, decreases with the distance to the nearest hospital. So this is when we um, look at the, the village level. So we take every village in Rajasthan, uh, and then we uh, our town, our location, if you will, and then um, look at how many visits another BSBI scheme we can find in the claims that are for that village. And we find that um, as you go further away from the nearest hospital, the share female goes down um, across all age groups. Okay, so distance is another uh, cost that households are less willing to pay uh, for female and for male patients. Okay, and this is you know, saying the same thing, except that here what we do in specification three, column three, we actually add household fixed facts. So what does it mean? It means that even within a household, if we see two patients from the same household going to get care under the scheme, we find that if the patient is female from that household, uh, she's much more likely to have been taken to you know, the nearest hospital to their home rather than a hospital outside the district. Uh, which, and also, I didn't show it here, but also the a female patient is much less likely to be taken to the private hospital. She's taken to the nearby public hospital. Okay, so the distance travel for a female patient, so that really suggests that there is differential um, investments in care within the household. So um, now I'm gonna, I don't have very much time left. I'm not seeing if you're sending me uh, chats, I'm not seeing it. Um, so, you know, please, uh, um, Dr. Sen, like speak up if, if you want to tell me how much time I have left, but you know, very quickly. Um, we, we can um, do two types of analysis to see what could, you know, you know whether paneling more hospitals would help, given what I just showed you with the distance. And so here we're exploiting the fact that in uh, December 2017, there was a change in the scheme. They changed the reimbursement rate, they increased on average reimbursement, reimbursement rates for the hospitals, and they did a big push, the government did a big push to have more pub, uh, private hospitals than panel. Um, and so what we can do, we can do what's called, you know, um, an event study where we look at, um, you know, that's when the, the, the change happened and the distance uh, to the closest uh, private hospital really dropped um, for, you know, um, for households that live, you know, near 
um, the near, near hospital um, that was unpaneled. Okay, so that's kind of like a mechanical first stage where partitioning people between those living in an area close to a hospital that unpaneled uh, soon um, after the change versus a hospital that unpaneled um, you know, much later, okay? And so when there's this sudden uh, shock and, and your uh, hospital and panels very near you, uh, it changes the distance to the closest private hospital. We see that it leads to an increase uh, in a number of visits. So that's the absolute number of visits by male patients and female patients. They both increase, okay? So you, you uh, hospital uh, and panels near you, there's more visits, uh, but more visits from everyone, okay? As many from men and women, and so that means that actually the, the share of female patients is not changed, okay? So it's really this idea that you can make, if you make things cheaper, um, you, you can get um, you know, everybody to go more. And that's great, so it's more care, but it doesn't uh, solve the gender uh, uh, inequity problem, okay? Um, so that's that's a pretty pretty striking. And so what does this mean about, you know, the demand curves, you know, from what I've shown you, it seems like the, if you if you plot the male usage rate, so the likelihood that people use the scheme uh, based on its price, um, it's a downward sloping uh, relationship, like in blue. And uh, for female, it's also downward sloping and it's below. Okay, and the ratio of these two lines are such that uh, you know as you decrease the price, you don't really change the female share for quite a while because they are really just like two uh, you know two two on top of each other. I mean, there, there, there's no. It's not like the female usage rate. Is more price sensitive, okay? And so, if you want to really to increase uh, the female share, uh, you may actually have to go into negative prices, which means that subsidizing uh, more than a hundred percent, saying if you bring women for care, we're going to give you uh, money, which is, for example, um, what the GSY program um, is is doing. So that's something that's not at all, you know, uh, out of the question. Uh, but it seems here that based on what we see, that you know, to 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 reduce um, the gender gap just using subsidies as an instrument is going to be quite tricky because it seems like this is how the the the, the, the demand curves look like uh, by gender okay so the last point is you know given that you know it's it, it, given the shape of these demand curves it seems like ideally um to reduce the gender gap uh you would you would move this green demand curve up you know so the question is what can you do to shift to shift demand for women care. How do you make uh, households value the health of their women as much as that of their men so that they would just have the same demand curve? You wouldn't have a lower uh, demand curve for health for women and for men. So can we shift this green uh, demand curve so that it overlaps with the blue one? And you know, I, I, I don't have very many um, uh, you know, opportunities to 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 to, to test that. Um, maybe you know, if you know of a program that has been put in place to try to change uh, women's place in society, that can then be linked to health outcomes. It's a, you know would be a great thing to do and and to see whether that makes a difference. In our context, what we can do is like we can look at whether being exposed to female staff punches over a long period of time uh, changes uh, the equation in the villages. Okay, and so you're all familiar with a with a you know the the the, the system. Um, and the fact that there are reservations for women uh, at the at the sarpanch level, um, and it's a very it has a it's a very binding policy. So being reserved for a female sarpanch in a given election year increases by ninety percentage points likelihood that you have a female leader. So in other words, absent the reservation, pretty much you know all the sarpanches are, are are male, and then we have a reservation it goes to almost you know ninety five percent female. Okay, so it's a very a very effective policy in terms of changing the gender of the leaders. Um, and so we, we, we can follow the literature that has exploited the random allocation of reservations across time to study the effects of female leadership. And previous studies have found that female sarpanches do uh, things differently than male sarpanches, they invest differently, and that uh, exposure to such sarpanches can change uh, gender attitude. So this is this, this literature that exists, okay? So when we do that and we look at whether um, we see more female claims in the BSBY data set in the, coming from the villages where you had more reservations historically, uh, on the whole, we see a positive coefficient, but it's not significant. If we zoom in on the children, that's where we see a positive effect. So for each time the, the panchayat was reserved, the village falls into a panchayat that was reserved, 
we see an extra, you know, 0 0.85 uh, percent uh, in the share of female among patients. Okay. Uh, for the women are 15 to 49, we also see a positive significant effect. But for women who are 50 plus, uh, 50 years and older, we actually see a negative effect. Okay. And that's, we, we, we don't quite know why that could be. So if you have any hypothesis as to why that could be, I would love to hear them. This, this kind of like really uh, striking result that increasing um, gender attitude in the village through this exposure to female leaders seems to be making a little bit of a difference for the younger generations, but uh, on the positive side, but negative for the older uh, one. And if we try to drill in, we find that, you know, essentially this is driven by many more visits by the younger women with no change for men at this uh, two younger age group. For the older age group, it's mostly that men now are more likely to go. So for the female subconscious somehow managed to make it that older men get more care relatively. So it's not like older women get less care, older men get relatively more care. So that means that the gender gap increases uh, for older age groups uh, while it decreases for the younger age groups. Okay. So, you know, we try to do a whole bunch of surveys to understand what's going on. We talked with, um, with households and we talked with subconscious themselves. Uh, and we, we find that, uh, you know, essentially because I'm out of time, I have to go very fast. But what we find is that in the villages where the, um, that fall under a uh, panchayat where the serpent was reserved um, multiple times, uh, villages are much more likely to be in touch, and especially women, to have contact with the ASHA um, on a regular uh, basis. And so possibly the ASHAs are like helping women uh, get information about the scheme and telling them you should go to the hospital because you can get uh, you can get free care. But awareness about the program being there is actually not higher. So I mean, it's not so much about the ASHAs promoting the program, but the ASHAs just being there telling women, hey, you should go get care. Uh, you seem to have something that's not good. Um, and then when we talk with the subconscious, they confirm that they spend more time monitoring uh, the work of the ASHAs and trying to make sure that the ASHAs would have uh, regular interactions with households. Um, and, and female subconscious do seem to care a little bit more about health than male subconscious, but this is all you know, very suggestive. So you know, we, we do have, um, overall, it seems like the greater support from, uh, from local health workers may be the reason why we see this uh, you know, decrease in the gender gap for younger ages in, in BSBY, but then we still have this mystery as to why the, you know, the female self-interest fail at helping older women, um, elderly women get, get more access to care. Okay, so I'm pretty much done here. Um, uh, I had, you know, a, a little epilogue for you that I want to have time for um, looking at gender gaps during the COVID crisis in terms of access to care. But for now, let me just stop here and just remind you of the main conclusion, which is that um, this program seems to have increased, uh, you know, female healthcare utilization, but because of gender bias, it, it also increased, uh, um, you know, male uh, utilization um, uh, and even more, okay? So where the, when the marginal rupee is spent on mental health and care still remains not completely free, then if you just reduce costs, um, you know, you, you actually do not necessarily reduce gender disparities. And so targeting females more directly and longer term efforts to shift the position of women are going to be necessary uh, to make a huge difference in them in terms of gender gaps in access to care. So I'm going to stop here um, and then uh, look at the questions. I don't know whether should look at the chat myself or if someone can moderate and, and ask me the questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dupa. No, that has been a fantastic uh, uh, paper and uh, it, it's very relevant and it's very timely and it's very important. Uh, you know, before I start taking the questions you know, from the attendees, I have a few uh, you know, questions that I wanted to ask you. Is that uh, at the beginning of the paper, you have mentioned that the number of observation was 3.3 you know, .3 million. Mm -hmm. So are these all like you know, unique visits to the hospital or? Uh... Yes, so 3.3 .3 million are unique. Uh, unique uh, visits, that's right. Unique uh, claims filed by a hospital and the claim is essentially for uh, one, it's a patient uh, slash visit um, observation, yeah. At one point of time, you have also mentioned that you know there is a there is an internet internalization of the discrimination, right? So this this yeah. uh, this gender uh, uh, utilization gap uh, at some point of time it might be voluntary in nature. You have mentioned that there might not be 
enough number of uh, uh, female doctors in the hospital, which might be one of the deterrents of uh, uh, for the you know the female um, uh, patients. So, do you think that uh, is it is it possible, or you know, uh, did your study look at the possibility that what is the kind of infrastructure provided at the hospital, right? So, you know, which might deter some female patient as well, you know, probably, you know, there is a, a not good enough bathroom for uh, the female patients or, you know, maybe the, uh, the general wards, there is not enough privacy. Uh, do you think, you know, these might be some possible uh, uh, reasons? Um, so that so those could be reasons. Now these reasons are less likely to apply for very, very young patients for for babies, right? So this bathroom issue, you know, for a four year old maybe it's not it's not a big deal. So because we see very very big gaps, you know, for this very yeah. young age group, mm -hmm. you know, it 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 actually it suggests that there's something more. So it's not to say that these issues are not important. They may very well be important, but there is something beyond that. It's also worth noting that. Um, the, and I didn't mention that, but the reason why for the age group, uh, you know, 15 to 49, that's where we see the gender gap um, overall being close to 50, uh, being, I mean, not the gender gap, the, the female share being just about 50%. Yeah. So if you just look at that, it looks like there is not that much of a gap. And if you look by disease, you see big gaps, okay? Yeah. And that's because a lot of the visits for female age 15 to 49 are related to childbirth. And while we remove the childbirth visit themselves, we cannot necessarily remove from the data set the visits related to childbirth because they may not be coded as related to childbirth. Often they are coded as like a general ward visit. Right. What we know from the data that many of them happen just before a birth. So, so they very much look like they are related to you know complications due to like our last minute issues with a pregnancy, but we can't you know get the, we can't we can't remove them because they're not tagged as such. And so the fact that when it comes to pregnancy and childbearing. We do see women come to the hospital, you know, that suggests that even these barriers that you're mentioning aren't, you know, so important that they preclude women from wanting to come when they when they need to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, the last question that I had was that uh, uh, so this this uh, utilization gap is it uh, is it same across you know all income group? Uh, because I asking this question because at one point of time we have mentioned about the utility function. You know, um, uh, traditionally yeah. women. Uh, prefer to put the household's income, you know, more than their own personal health, internalizing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah. is it is this interna internalization the same across? Did you find you know, there is any disparity across different income groups? So that's a very good uh, question. Unfortunately, in our data, we don't know anything about people's income, still, income level, right? In the claims data, we just know your um your 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 gender your age um your residence we don't know anything about income um and we could only survey people who show up um you know in the who show up in the in the claim mm -hmm. um but so the so we could check whether among we could check the the gender the SAS composition among those that we were able to survey to see if um women are disproportionately from a uh, from a higher um, uh, income level, but remember that we also find big differences within household. Okay, we can do analysis with household fixed effects. So if we have to, you know, the same Bamasha number because the Bamasha card ID uh, ID is at the household level, so we can identify you know household that way, and we do find differences within the household. So within the household, um, you know, so so so. so It'd be great if we could look at whether that varies by uh, income status. I mean, remember, BSBY is only for the poor. I mean, now it's a lot of people. It's about you know the bottom forty percent. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and th so and it could you know the the idea that we favor the breadwinner. Um, yeah. So the health, uh, the the value of the health of the male is greater uh, because um, because the the male is a breadwinner. Um, you know that's that you know that, that could that um that explanation is a little bit hard to reconcile with the fact that um mm -hmm. we see also the gaps among the children right boys versus girls um because boys are not the breadwinners uh at least at least you know in the in that current time period they may be in the future but not at that time period uh, one of the attendees, Srikriti, has asked a question that um she has i think you know this is an anecdotal 
uh, thing that she has mentioned. She said that there are a lot of superstitions and lack of education in villages in India. This leads to females not believing in the skills and qualification of doctors and often turn mm-hmm. to self-medication or no medication at all. I have personally seen this. My household helper is from a village in Rajasthan and she recently delivered a child, but she would always refuse to take medication from the doctor and trusted tips and hacks given to her by her relatives. What do you think can be done to make them trust the doctors more? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, I mean, what our data shows is that this very same woman, when it comes to getting medication for her son versus her daughter, she's very likely to to, to get the medication for the son and not for the daughter. So I think it's, you always want to take things with a little bit of nuance because, you know, um, ultimately these this, this beliefs uh, seem to always end up leading to gender um, differences. Um, and the, you know, there is a lot of, I mean, I think this goes back to the issue of internalization, which is like, if my households really don't want to spend money on me, they are going to convince me that, you know, I shouldn't and that this is not good, right? So it's very difficult to to use a revealed preference um, argument. You know, economists would like to think in terms of revealed preference and say, well, if you do something, that means that that's what you, you know, think and prefer. But here, that's the case where what really are your true preference and beliefs? Um, I think there is a, a big role for uh, potentially ashas here, and so that may be why we see this effect of the, you know, through the ashas in the area that were reserved for female suffrage, where the ashas can help counteract, or other, you know, village health workers can help counteract uh, these beliefs. But I think it's important to keep in mind that there is um, in trust in the medical profession. Uh, is definitely something that's very important and, and and very difficult to obtain. And there is a lot of evidence of really, excuse my language, but crappy behavior by health workers. There's a lot of, you know, uh, um, even among, you know, MDs, um, even among, you know, like famous professors at, uh, you know, public hospital, there is some, um, you know, not enough enough effort being put, people uh, not really trying their best, uh, prescribing drips when you don't need that. And so the fixing the quality, fixing the you know the the quality of the supply is super important. As long as the average quality of care is kind of like mediocre, it's not very surprising that people don't 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 trust um, because maybe maybe half of the time they go and they get care that doesn't actually match what they what what they, what they need. So I think it's a huge uh, problem um, that is re- and that you know is going to require improving the quality of care uh, more broadly. And that's one of the idea of this scheme is to say well. Fixing the quality of the supply in the public system is going to be very hard. Incentives for doctors are not quite there. We don't quite want to see that. Let's move over to the private sector, where there is like financial incentives for hospitals to provide higher quality care. Um, so that's part of this the idea of like subsidizing the care at the private facilities. But nevertheless, there is massive heterogeneity in quality across the private sector, and uh, helping um, improve. Um, Quality and trust is very important. I agree with that. Yes. Um, but we have another question. You know, uh, it says uh, Rajasthan at 66.11% literacy rate back in 2011 survey was one of the lowest in the country where the national average was about 73%. So do you think, you know, that a better literacy rated state, the state with a better literacy rate would, with a similar policy would perform better? So is... Well, yeah, so, I mean, I, I would... Um, I would um, <laughs> I would hope so, but at the same time, um, there is a recent study that did very uh, kind of like the same analysis that uh, that we've done uh, in the context of the PMJ data, where they have data for many uh, other states. Um, not Rajasthan uh, is not one of them because um, it was not in, included in the early version of the program, but. Uh, and they find gender gaps very similar to ours um, in, in, in most of the states. So it, it, it seems to be like pervasive across um, across the country and not specific to to Rajasthan. So it you know it would be good to just check. I don't have the number from the top of my head and to see whether across states there seems to be a correlation between gen- gender gap and illiteracy, and then that would confirm your hypothesis. Um, but even in in areas that may have more literacy, it seems like there's still a, a gap that that persists. Uh, we have one uh, question. It's not a question. It's more of a statement from Aditya Sharma. I think you know it. It, it answers you know the, when, one of the questions that I've asked uh, earlier. It said that uh, I have lived in Rajasthan for quite a while. I would like to point out that medical facilities there are 
phenomenal as compared to other states that I have uh, had a chance to be in. Also, many people are fairly aware uh, about all the schemes and they take advantage of them. Women representation in hospital and nursing homes are also good. The problem is the hospital availability. Most of the villages do not have a local hospital and they have to travel a minimum of seven to eight kilometers to reach. So, right, so this might be, you know, one of the other problems, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the people there uh, they face maybe. Yeah. Yes, but um, you know, it seems like facing that problem, households are more willing to deal with that problem when it comes to the male patients within the household and the female patients. So I think that this explanation, you know, uh, can can only explain that gender gap if we accept the idea that there is a lower willingness to uh, pay costs for for female patients, with lower willingness to travel for female patients. Yeah. Uh, many of our attendees, they have mentioned about the patriarchal norms uh, that are existing in India and in some you know, parts of India. I, I think in, in your paper also you have mentioned about the patrilinearity and patri locality uh, at, at point at different at some point of time. So uh, do you think you know that you know of course you know there are several other problems you have included a number of uh, variables to see their impacts. On the disparity, but do you think that it is also a sociocultural uh, thing, right? So it's something that's deep rooted uh, into this. So the, the the very way the women in a household they perceive their utility function. Uh, so it's just the household's utility and a household's benefit which matters more to them rather than their own, uh, you know, well-being, uh, uh, health, uh, uh, you know, the the, the the own uh, state of their own health. They're less willing to spend money on their own health you know they would rather save money uh, and to buy something for the household so do you think it is also a cultural thing and more deep rooted than yeah well so there are two different things i think in the question one is is it cultural and the other one is is it women themselves um internalizing and, and making that choice so on the latter one, I think it's very tricky to say it's women making the choice not to get care for themselves. Because if you want to use that explanation, then you have to explain to me why you see that for girls. Girls are not making a choice. Yeah, they are not getting the care. Someone is making a choice for them, yes. okay? So I, I think it's very important to say it's not, you know, this is not women bringing that onto themselves. Um, um, it's brought onto them when they are kids. Um, and then, you know, the, the, why this persists, uh, and, and it's like maybe if, if you've never gotten care when you were a child, why would you even expect that you're going to get care when you're older? Okay, so it's, it's a bit tricky, I think, to say it's women choosing that because they value their household more. Also, remember, it's, it's you know, this is like highly subsidized care. So it's like, and, and they're not even, the household are not even using the entire amount they are allowed to. So the women could still get the care, at, you know, without uh, taking away the potential benefit for the other members of the household. Okay, so um, that's just another thing to comes from cultural, social cultural stuff. Mm. Absolutely, this is the entire. This is exact everything I'm telling you here. There is a bias. There is a norm, um, a social norm, a deep rooted bias against women in uh, in um, in you know in 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 the societies um, that explain that. Yeah, that's that's precisely the problem, and the fact that it it it, it you know uh, and it's very difficult <laughs> to uh, you know the social norms evolve you know very slowly. Um, they are hard to change. Even exposure to female leaders you know don't move the needle that much. Um, and obviously there is um, you know the, the, there's a lot of literature on this and trying to think of to change that. And there's some recent work that by um, uh, Divada uh, Sima Jaya Chandran and Tarun Jain, that's forthcoming in the American Economic Review, where they worked with an NGO called Breakthrough, where they work in schools trying to uh, educate youth um, very early on about you know, gender equity. And they do find that um, you know, reported uh, attitudes towards women uh, by both young girls and young boys really improve when they've been going through that program in school. Of trying to change attitudes. Now it remains to be seen whether down the road it changes the behavior as well. But at least at a very young age, uh, trying to change how people perceive the relative role of women and men in society, um, you know, maybe maybe very important. Um, and I think you know more more work um, uh, on, on on this would be really 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 super important. Um, the the 
you know, whenever you have a norm that hurts a group, you know, it typically is because some group benefits yeah. from it. So, you know, the, that group doesn't want to let go because, like, they like having uh, control and be on top of the hierarchy, right? So, uh, when you have a hierarchy, toppling it is tricky because the person at the top doesn't want to doesn't want to share. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of other questions. We have, you know, about 40 questions in line there, but you know, I'll just ask you one last question and, you know, I can probably at some point of time, you know, send you all the questions over email. Uh, so, and that'd be wonderful, yeah. So uh, uh, this has been asked by, you know, a couple of our uh, attendees here, uh, is that, I mean, what is the solution to that, right? So, you know, what kind of policy do you think, you know, would be the most effective in addressing this, uh, uh, this uh, gender disparity? So, I mean, you know, I think in the short run, uh, if we go back to this, you know, oops, um, you know, I, uh, you know, you'd say, well, it was just like uh, paying, you know, giving cash to a household whenever they bring uh, a female patient uh, who needs um, who needs care. Um, obviously, you want to be mindful of more hazards. So if you say, I'm going to give you money each time you bring a daughter with a broken arm, yeah. you know, that's another great idea because, you know, people, they broke their daughter's arms in order to get the cash. That, uh, that's more hazard mm -hmm. in health insurances. That we don't want that. But things like, you know, if there's appendicitis or if there is, um, you know, kidney disease, or like you, you get uh, subsidies, you know, to even like to help compensate for the cost of transportation. I think that'd be great. Now, this is already in place with the GSY program for deliveries. And the thing is, it would be good to just check, um, you know, the uh, estimates of the impact of such programs um, to, you know, be, before going full, full full ahead. But you know, that would be one that would be one way to just say, okay, we just we, we need to go, you know, beyond uh, beyond um, beyond uh, free. And especially since we know hospitals are not respecting the schemes and still charging out of pocket, hmm. uh, making sure that you know the costs are compensated is important. Um, then moving that green. Uh, Bar to be, you know, higher. So there's, you know, like changing the the norms and uh, the value of women in society. I mean, that's like the trillion dollar question. You know, if I knew, um, if I knew how to do that, um, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I would not be an academic. I would just be a policy advocate. You know, um, I just, I just do not know. Um, you know, I think it's a very tricky question. I mean, and this is related to other. There are other aspects of. Uh, you know, discrimination in the Indian society, like the caste system being still extremely prevalent. And that's another form of norm that leads to, you know, massive inequities and, and changing those is extremely, um, extremely difficult. So um, the, yeah, I wish I had, you know, <laughs> I could say more, um, but it, what, what we really, we can say that anything that's gender, a policy that's gender neutral, uh, can make a difference in people's lives, but not a difference in equity. You need to, to do more uh, specific targeting um, of, um, of, 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 of women. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor, for uh, you know answering all this question. Once again, this has been a fantastic presentation, and uh, 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 you know I'm really looking forward to you know read uh, your you know for the research in this particular area. I have you know, gone through the paper. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Once again, thank you very, very much for coming here and joining with us today and, uh, you know, talking to us, uh, sharing your research with us. And, you know, this has been a fantastic experience and we are really fortunate you know, to have you here. I'm sure that, you no, know, once again, you know, once the university opens up, once, you know, the international travel normalizes, uh, we all hope that at some point of time, we'll be fortunate enough to host you in our uh, beautiful campus. And you know where I can interact with our faculty and our students. I hope that in that they will come soon. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot for uh, yeah. joining with us today. No, thank you so much. I'd love to come and visit. And uh, I'm sorry we couldn't deal with all the questions, but if you can please send them to me about the chat and the Q and A, I would really like to be able to see um, all of the comments and questions. That'd be very helpful also to inform. Sure, I, I, I will hope. pull in the question and send send it over to you. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have Thank a great you. evening. Thank Thanks for staying up for this. Bye-bye. Bye. You have a great day, too. Bye. Thank you.